Assalamu alaikum students. So we carry on circulation uh, and today's topic is uh, a chapter in Guyton labeled as local and humoral control of tissue blood flow. Basically we'll be talking about uh, the blood flow at the level of tissues and how it's uh, regulated uh, using various physiological mechanisms. Inshallah. So basically, first we'll look at some general points about why local blood flow is important, why are we even discussing this, the various theories that govern uh, this whole topic, and then uh, the, the, the crux of the whole lecture is about the various mechanisms uh, that regulate local blood flow, and they're divided into broadly acute and long-term mechanisms. So what is the importance here? What are we talking about and why are we talking about this? So as we know that there are various organs in the body, okay, and uh, there is no uniform blood flow. We have, we've discussed this, uh, that circulation is arranged in parallel, the heart being arranged in series. So circulation being arranged in parallel means that every organ gets to choose how much blood flow uh, it it receives, and this is based on various uh, various things which we'll discuss. But first, let's see uh, uh, this different blood flow thing. So this is an interesting example that lungs they accommodate the entire entire cardiac output uh, per minute or whatever of the of the heart. So uh, there is an extremely large flow of blood through the lungs all the time and it's the requirement because it it needs the blood needs to be oxygenated so obviously uh, uh, there are other examples like git kidneys skeletal muscles which uh, take up 25 percent of cardiac output each so again this is a this is a rather high blood flow uh, uh, through these tissues and uh, this is according to their function so the point here is various organs have various blood flows. So blood flow as, as, as an event, as, uh, as a sequence, need, as a process, needs to be understood properly in the context of various organs. So that's why the word local comes in, local blood flow. By local blood flow, we mean that blood flow through organs locally. Um, and and how come this there is difference in these blood flow? Well, there there is the vascular resistance uh, in various tissues, which is different. So you would expect the lung vascular resistance to be low, okay, because it needs to have high blood flow, okay. And then there is that very big thing which we'll be discussing over and over again later on in the lecture is the tissue need. Basically, the tissue need. Uh, dictates in most uh, cases how much blood will flow through this organ. So uh, an overall uh, sort of view of the mechanisms uh, timeline wise and broad uh, process wise. This is a good slide to give you a, a map of what uh, will happen in the rest of the lecture. So local uh, factors which control blood flow can be divided into two long and long term i beg your pardon acute and long term by acute here we mean seconds to minutes and this is again as always uh, any change in blood flow can be affected by uh, changing the diameter of the vessel if you constrict it then obviously you are decreasing blood flow if you're dilating it you are increasing blood flow so this is manipulated by various factors, which we'll discuss uh, uh, very quick, very soon. Uh, this is the mainstay of changing blood pressure, uh, blood flow to organs uh, in the short term. However, in the long term, which basically spans from minutes to uh, hours to days, weeks, and months, uh, there is something else going on uh, because look, Vasoconstriction and dilation, i.e. manipulating the diameter of a vessel, this is uh, a quick fix, okay? Uh, this, is an, uh, this is a quick manipulation, uh, uh, quick fix, and it does have a limitation. 
So you can't have a perpetual vasoconstriction or a vasodilation. Some things, something gives, and then these things are reversed. So these are, uh, these are acute em emergency mechanisms which come into play immediately. They're extremely important. However, they, they have limited long-term uh, effectiveness. In the long term, you would like to think about infrastructure. You would like to think about increasing the physical size of the vessels and very importantly, the number of the vessels. You would like to have more vessels, collaterals they are called, and so on and so forth. Or maybe change the size of the, of the existing vessel so that uh, it, it, uh, it can fit to the uh, new reality of, of, this, of this organ. So these are the local factors uh, as, a, as a timeline continuum. Uh, then there are overarching nervous and hormonal mechanisms. So if you, uh, the top of the line is the sympathetic nervous system. And we know how what it, this does, generally speaking. It vasoconstricts or dilates depending on the receptor. So if it's uh, alpha 1 receptor, it will vasoconstrict. If it's beta, it will vasodilate. And this is not epinephrine we're talking about. Uh, and then there are hormones, histamine, bradykine, and prostaglandins. You must have heard this uh, many, many times before. These are basically, some of them are uh, vasodilators and some of them are vasoconstrictors. So hormones basically are also divided into vasoconstrictors and vasodilators, and they have uh, a, a, an effect on the tissue. However, let me just announce here that the local, the local mechanisms take precedence when we are talking about uh, various organs, various local tissues, they take a back seat. All right, in this context. Okay, let's move on. So we talked about the theories governing uh, local blood flow. Uh, so broadly speaking, very broadly speaking, we have the vasodilator theory, and then we have the oxygen demand theory. Let me say this once here, and then I'll repeat it later on. These are the theories of local blood flow or any blood flow, okay? Uh, they will be used in various physiological mechanisms later on. So remember theory is a big thing. And th th theory has uh, 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 many applications. So as, uh, let me give you an example, Fick's law, F-I-C-K apostrophe S, Fick's law. Fick's law uh, you studied in physics. So it, it, it has, a, it has a, a mathematical, metaphysical application. Then we'll discuss Fick's law in uh, uh, measuring cardiac output uh, in this lecture series. Uh, th there is also an application of Fick's law in renal physiology, so in biological systems. So my point here is theories are, are overarching big concepts that, that find their application across many uh, disciplines, many sciences. So this is that kind of, these are that, those kind of theories. Uh, they uh, uh, attempt to explain the, the biggest picture available. And then you need to break it down into physiological concepts, uh, which may borrow either from this or this or both. This will make more sense in the coming slides. So let's let's stick along here. So vasodilator theory, as the name indicates, uh, has to do with some sort of a vasodilatory substance. And according to this theory, uh, all tissues have a, a a balance between vasoconstrictors, local vasoconstrictors, and local vasodilators. So the vasodilatory theory says that when the vasodilator substances are available in more quantity vasodilation happens and blood flow to the organ is increased uh, and it, it it lays its uh, whole weight on these vasodilatory substances the presence of them in the tissues and namely this is the most studied and the most famous of vasodilators as adenosine it causes as the whole thing says it's, it's a vasodilator Carbon dioxide, when it's increased in the tissue, also acts as a vasodilator. So does histamine, potassium, and hydrogen. Okay, so this is this theory. However, later on, 
this theory became uh, into vogue as well oxygen demand theory according to this basically what happens is uh, if if uh, if you push a, a, an organ at rest into a higher metabolic rate profile i.e if it's skeletal muscle and you start exercising okay so now a skeletal muscle before exercise was at rest and now you have started exercising so its uh, metabolic requirements and metabolic rate has increased it will consume more oxygen and produce more carbon dioxide and so on and so forth now it's the oxygen that i would like you to focus it is consuming more oxygen so the oxygen tension will drop in the tissue this is postulated uh, and very strongly postulated to cause vasodilation so basically when there is decreased oxygen tension in the tissue this is a powerful signal to vasodilate its vessels so that more blood can come in ie bringing in more oxygen and nutrients there is a nutrient demand theory as well which goes along the same lines really this became a bit more in vogue so as you can see this this, this is a nice diagram which shows the meta arteriole and it's it, it's it's giving off this side arm capillary and this is a pre capillary sphincter so whenever there is a decrease oxygen delivery uh, due to increased tissue metabolism what what basically happens is local hypoxia here this will relax the not just the arteriole but also the pre capillary sphincter here so that there is more blood flow to this area where you have a drop in po2 this basically is the oxygen demand theory so again these are the big names uh, and we need to now translate this into practical human physiology physiological uh, local blood flow mechanisms okay so what are the acute mechanisms let's let's talk about this okay so we were talking about acute mechanisms and in acute mechanisms uh, we 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 re, we study three mechanisms auto regulation active hyperemia and reactive hyperemia now i would like to uh, give a word of caution here uh, uh, this is not exactly the sequence of uh, your textbook uh, guyton uh, i have changed it uh, so that it's more uh, student learner oriented so with that caution let's proceed so once again acute mechanisms are three auto regulation active and reactive hyperemia now i understand that these two you may have already uh, studied to some extent uh, in your uh, high school we'll start with the uh, auto regulation so basically as the name itself indicates there are various uh, organs which are very famous for regulating their own blood flow so they don't really need uh, a lot of external nervous system or hormonal uh, input they are just sort of master of their own blood flow destiny and they and they do a pretty good job so if you check this out it's a, it's a it's a very nice graph showing you auto regulation uh, 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 we increase the mean arterial pressure which is like the feeding pressure uh, to whatever organ and and check out how the blood flow change so as soon as it hit around 50 right up to 200 or a bit more look at the graph and look at the acute red graph first okay we'll talk about the green dotted one later so look at this when the pressure was increasing uh, below 50 blood flow to the tissue was increasing as well okay but as soon as uh, the mean arterial pressure hit 50 the curve sort of flattens right up to an extremely high value of around about 200ish mmhg now it's not a flat curve but it's relatively flat if you compare it with this part and certainly this part okay so this is auto regulation this part here so you are increasing the art mean arterial pressure ie the feeding arteries you are increasing the pressure in the feeding arteries the big arteries or even the medium arteries however beyond the uh, meta arteriole there is something which is resisting 
into transmitting this pressure in this huge range to cause any significant increases in blood flow. This is brilliant. And this is what autoregulation is. Uh, kidneys, brain, heart, skeletal muscle, they all uh, exhibit uh, uh, autoregulation, especially the kidneys and the brain. The heart as well, yes. Okay. Uh, look at the green dotted line now. It shows you the same autoregulation phenomena, but it's much more uh, accurate, efficient, uh, on the dot. So the blood flow uh, does increase. Uh, as uh, uh, it does in acute change in uh, mean arterial pressure. However, the autoregulation bit, the, 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 stop, the stopping of increasing of the blood flow really is enhanced uh, in the long term. What we mean basically by acute and long term is if the acute uh, increase in blood pressure was, la was later on sorted out and now the blood pressure has dropped back to its original situation, and this whole acute thing lasted uh, seconds or minutes or maybe some hours, and then everything came back to normal. Okay, that's acute. Uh, however, long term here means that the blood pressure fluctuation uh, was spread out over months to years, maybe. Uh, so that is the context of this graph, and that is how it's important. And you can imagine that blood flow uh, in the long term scenario is much more stable. Uh, which 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 shows you the resilience of uh, uh, the the auto regulation mechanisms in in these very crucial uh, tissues. Okay, this is this this point cannot be over elaborated. Uh, I I will inshallah mention this when I discuss the long term mechanisms. Hopefully, if I remember, but this is an important point to to note. So how come uh, this happens, uh, this autoregulation is, uh, is, takes place? So again, we take a leaf from our theories and the, the, the bigger theories are basically dissected out into smaller ones. So there is a metabolic theory and a myogenic theory. Of course, uh, as mentioned earlier many times, uh, these lectures are not a replacement for your personal reading of books. Uh, especially your textbook, one at least one book. So do read these things in detail from your books. Uh, very briefly, metabolic theory basically, uh, simply put, it, it means that if the metabolic profile of the tissue is increased, uh, if it uses more oxygen, produces more carbon dioxide, hydrogen, potassium, this uh, temperature is increased, okay? pH drop, uh, pH is in, uh, uh, drops rather, because there's increased hydrogen ions. All this environment basically invites uh, more uh, blood flow uh, to, the, to the area automatically. So the tissue itself, here we are discussing metabolic theory, the tissue itself adjusts its own blood flow according to its metabolic profile. Okay, so when it produces carbon dioxide, hydrogen, potassium, adenosine, uh, they are vasodilatory substances. And so there's vasodilation. And as soon as there is vasodilation, more blood will come into this tissue, address the increased demand. And then when there is, uh, 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 its increased demand is addressed, the vasodilatory substances, their, their, their concentration drops, and hence the blood flow back, comes back to normal, autoregulation, okay? This is the metabolic theory. Myogenic theory is, is, is more uh, colorful. In the sense that we are we are basically now going inside the, the 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 structure of the vessels. So, if you examine a meta arteriole uh, in its detail, in its structure, anatomical structure, you will find a lot of smooth muscles in its walls. Okay. Now there is a there is a habit, there is a response of this of this uh, this uh, smooth muscle. Uh, in that if you stretch it suddenly, it will try to resist that stretch by contract. This is a very important point that you need to understand. This will come in later uh, when you study renal physiology because uh, autoregulation is a very, very key mechanism in, in control of uh, uh, renal blood flow. 
and you can imagine that kidney basically deals in filtration of blood let's say your first year so purification of blood okay so to quote unquote purify blood or detoxify it or you know remove the bad agents from it you need to let the blood go through the kidney so now you can imagine that the blood is more the kidneys are small so there's a lot of blood flow going through the kidney and then to complicate this issue furthermore you don't sit still do you the entire day you move around you sleep you exercise uh, you study uh, you go to the washroom uh, you eat drink so there's a, a whole lot of uh, routine activity that you put your body through which has uh, effects on the blood volume and blood pressure okay now the kidney needs to be pretty much with the program here uh, uh, reading the uh, renal artery blood pressure and not reacting to the fluctuations that the renal artery pressure goes through if it starts to react to every fluctuation then you will not have a consistent blood flow through the kidney and hence kidney won't be able to do its job so this is where the myogenic theory really explains uh, a lot of uh, matters uh, in of uh, auto regulation especially in, a, in an organ as important as the kidney so if you were let me just put uh, put my focus on the kidney now uh, although auto regulation is a generic phenomenon but let me just say it so that it helps you uh, visualize that we're talking about a specific organ so if you were to increase suddenly the pressure in renal artery the feeding vessel of the kidney what will happen what will happen is downstream i.e in the branches of uh, the renal artery which go into the kidney tissue and then uh, divide and this that the other and eventually form the afferent arteriole of the glomerulus i know you you should remember this much uh, of uh, the kidney artery vasculature that is so it this sudden increase in the in the pressure from the feeder basically will elicit a response in the vasculature inside the kidney and it will vasoconstrict the the smooth muscles of the of the vessels will actually constrict now you would think which is a natural which not natural sorry it's a common misconception uh, in first years that if you were to vasoconstrict uh, in in a in a in a scenario of already increased pressure wouldn't that lead to increased pressure uh, no correct this uh, concept straight away and why because of mr laplace laplace probably was a french scientist and his famous equation uh, discusses wall tension this is something new for you so now you need to understand that the vessel wall itself has a life it's it's an intelligent wall it's not just a wall it has a life of its own and when you're talking about the arteriole or the arteries big and medium we are talking about a lot of smooth muscle in the wall and when there's a lot of smooth muscle in the wall you need to understand how it behaves in various blood pressure scenario and this will come in the long term uh, scenario uh, at the end of this lecture as well it's a very interesting discussion later on as well so laplace says that wall tension or it's called shear shear tension shear i.e pressure so wall pressure denoted by t is directly proportional to the radius of the vessel very important point and the pressure within the vessel the pressure of the fluid okay this is an obvious point however it's the radius bit which is interesting and this is where your concept needs to be clarified so if you if you have a larger vessel the tension on the wall of this vessel will be more okay if you have a smaller vessel the tension on the wall will be lesser uh think of it is as, as as follows if you have a smaller vessel you won't be able to pass through it a lot of fluid right it will it will it will uh, uh, have less fluid going through it if there is less volume the the pressure on the wall 
exerted will be less. Okay, remember it. Remember it like that. So anyhow, once again recapping the myogenic theory. So myogenic theory basically says that if the pressure inside a vessel increases, it will vasoconstrict and decrease the pressure immediately, so that there is no increase in pressure. And this is an automatic, intrinsic uh, behavior of the vessel of vessels in organs which uh, display autoregulation. Again, have a read, and uh, I, I would say I would I would note. That Laplace equation uh, Guyton discusses in the long term, uh, under the long term mechanisms, I don't think that's very wise. Uh, it needs to be explained under the myogenic theory, in under acute mechanisms. So make this, uh, make this, uh, 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 make a note of this point. Okay. Now, there's a very important point here. When the uh, tissue goes into a lot of high metabolic uh, rate and uh, uh, say for example uh, a skeletal muscle goes into vigorous exercise uh, metabolic factors or actors they tend to trump myogenic mechanisms so metabolic factors the, the production of those vasodilators they basically dominate uh, the myogenic mechanisms and they just override it and they these are the ones that dictate uh, the vasodilations of this vessel okay right then we move on to active and and reactive hyperemia now i i'm i have an impression that you have studied this in your under uh, your high school uh so let, let's let me just compare these two active uh, hyperemia is basically increased uh, blood flow to the to a tissue in response to its metabolic activity if you increase the metabolic activity, there will be increase in blood flow. If you normalize it, the blood flow will go back to normal. This is called active hyperemia. Okay. Now, what is reactive hyperemia uh, in comparison to active hyperemia? Reactive hyperemia is uh, if you stop or if you decrease blood flow to, uh, to, a, to an organ, to a tissue, uh, it will use up the tissue obviously is alive and it's kicking and it's uh, it's metabolically active it will it will use up all the nutrients and oxygen which is available locally already in the tissue and then uh, there will be a, a a debt of nutrients and oxygen that it will incur because you're not letting the normal blood to flow in in, in uh, to this tissue so depending on the amount of time, the length of time that you have occluded the blood supply to this uh, tissue, the debt will increase naturally. It's a logical thing. And now when you release the occlusion, the blood flow will be such that it will not only have to address the debt of oxygen and nutrients, but uh, it will keep on adding blood uh, to the tissue Till it addresses the debt and till uh, and and then starts to supply the blood to this tissue uh, uh, at a, at a higher rate, and this will happen for us for some time, and then it will come down uh, to the normal level. So it compensates for the occlusion that you uh, you did, uh, and after a while it then naturally comes down to basal level. A small way of uh, Understanding reactive hyperemia is if you use your right hand uh, to, uh, to, to press hard on your left hand at the wrist. If you do that, you just compress your wrist, your left wrist with your right hand for a few seconds and then release it. When you release it, basically, feel what happens. You will feel that there is warmth coming in in your otherwise slightly colder hand when you were compressing it. This warmth is basically re under reactive hyperemia. The blood flow is now gushing into the, uh, the hand, uh, addressing what uh, needed addressing in terms of oxygen debt and nutrient debt during the occlusion. And after a while, you will stop feeling the warmth because the thing has now, the blood flow has now settled the matter and 
everything has gone back to normal. So a small uh, way of describing reactive hyperemia. Now let's look at these uh, very rather simple graphs. Uh, this is, uh, let's see the active hyperemia first. Uh, at zero time, you started stimulating a muscle. Uh, when, it, when you started stimulating it, the, the blood flow increased, okay, naturally, because the metabolic products caused vasodilation, and it started to increase blood flow by vasodilation, by vasodilating the arterioles, and you kept on stimulating it for two seconds. Right at two seconds, this whole slope of the graph basically is active hyperemia, and at the stoppage of uh, the stimulation, the blood flow, uh, not very sharply, but uh, rather acutely, does come down and hits the basic basal level, which it was at uh, initially before the stimulation. Okay. Now, um, reactive hyperemia is, is interesting. So you occlude the artery. You, so this, this is normal blood flow. You occlude it at zero second. So it stays occluded for two seconds, which is the opposite of what you did for active hyperemia. And as soon as you released it, check out the blood flow. It really goes up, 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 stays there for a while, pays all its debts, and then it comes down naturally. And then it hits uh, the normal blood flow pattern. Okay, so this is the difference between active and reactive hyperemia. Uh, just a quick note before I actually give you an example of reactive hyperemia. This is not just a concept, an academic concept. It actually has a very important clinical consequence. But just before I do that, uh, remember the vasodilatory theory, which, I, which we mentioned. So when you occluded your left wrist uh, to st stop or uh, decrease the blood supply to your left hand, what what happened in the left hand during that time? So when these metabolic products, they started accumulating, they are vasodilators, right? So let's say it like this, that the balance between vasoconstrictors and vasodilators tilted towards the vasodilators. Yes, but the vasodilators couldn't do anything. I mean, what are they going to do? You have occluded physically, you have occluded the feeding vessels. So even if there is dilation of the vessel, uh, there is mechanical compression of the arterial. So vasodilators cannot really express themselves, right? Now, as soon as you remove the constricting stimulus, the vasodilators, which already have really increased during the occlusion time in the affected tissue, now they have, they will express themselves. And now they will have a significant vasodilation, certain vasodilation, so that the graph really peaks uh, very quickly, uh, uh, raising the blood flow uh, uh, appropriately so that everything is done. So I just wanted to mention this vasodilatory theory, how it's applied to reactive hyperemia. Uh, and now the, the example. So coronaries, you know coronary supply myocardium, the heart muscle, right? So you also know that during systole, uh, there is, maybe you don't know. Okay, now you'll know because we'll, we'll be studying this tomorrow, by the way, anyway. Uh, so a very quick uh, glimpse into that. Uh, coronary blood flow during uh, heart systole drops. It's during diastole that coronary blood flow actually takes place nicely and properly. This might be a news flash for you. Once again, during systole of the heart, the coronaries, the, the blood flow in the coronaries drop. Why do they drop? We will discuss it tomorrow, but very quick point here is just to explain, is the coronaries are part, uh, are structurally a, structurally a part of the myocardium. So the, when the myocardium goes into contraction, it compresses the vessels. When it compresses the vessels, so naturally <clears throat> the blood flow will decrease. This is a structural uh, point of the heart uh, blood supply okay and it's only when the myocardium relaxes is when you have proper blood flow through the coronaries now where does reactive hyperemia fit in this you have compression of the coronaries in in uh, in one segment of uh, the cardiac cycle namely systole 
and when it gets released you have flow in the coronaries connect the dots so occlusion during systole is that occlusion of the left wrist that you that you did yes and when you released it there was increased blood flow to compensate for whatever happened in, during uh, occlusion this is what happens during cardiac diastole when the myocardium releases its pressure on the uh, coron uh, coronaries what happens is there is increased blood flow uh, then would have uh, happened normally in the coronaries okay now you understand that reactive hyperemia is actually a very important mechanism uh, in coronary blood flow more on this tomorrow inshallah we move on uh, this is a small point here uh, up till now we were discussing tissue blood flow itself so there is there are phenomena which also affect upstream vessels ie the small arteries and the medium sized arteries uh, which are supplying the blood to this tissue they also get affected by increased uh, or changed metabolic profile of the tissue itself so imagine this let me go back to this diagram this one so obviously this this meta arterial is coming from somewhere isn't it it's coming from a small artery and then the small artery is coming from a medium artery the medium artery is then coming from a big artery so this is what i'm referring to as uh, upstream so if you have if in this tissue you have increased uh, metabolism of this tissue it will have all sorts of effects on the meta arteriole the pre capillary sphincter and this that the other yes this is what we have discussed already now what we are saying is not just this happens upstream the 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 feeding vessels also get uh, a stimulus they also get affected by this local incidence or this local uh, activity of the tissue how come they are outside of this tissue they are not anatomically part of the tissue and they are away from the tissue as well what could possibly cause them to change anything in their blood flow this is the point of this slide so basically what happens is when you are you are drawing your blood from uh, uh, whichever medium artery into the meta arteriole and then uh, further on when you draw more blood because of increased metabolism the blood flow through the meta uh, through, through the medium artery also increases of course it needs to increase then the blood flow through the tissue will increase right so when this happens the shear the 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 wall tension on the blood uh, vessel wall of this medium artery it increases when it increases it this is where i want your attention when there is increase in wall tension during increased blood flow in this feeding artery in this scenario what happens is it triggers a response from the from the visceral smooth muscle of the wall such that it it is continuously forming nitrous oxide <clears throat> which is called basically it's a uh, it's it's a it's a factor endothelium derived i e it's it's derived from endothelium relaxing factor it relaxes so nitric oxide which normally is formed by visceral smooth muscles anyway but in this case the the rate of production of nitric oxide increases okay in this scenario it increases is it further relaxes this this uh, this vessel this uh, medium artery and when it further relaxes there is more blood flow flowing through it so that downstream the tissue gets more blood flow because that's what it requested yes i hope this is clear it's cause it causes vasodilation and 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 so more blood is supplied to the tissue okay uh, then opposite to that there is endothelin okay endothelin is the opposite the the step brother if you want to say that uh, to uh, erdf 
okay it causes vasoconstriction uh, this uh, is formed when the endothelium is damaged and this controls uh, blood flow it decreases blood flow so so you may not have too much uh, bleeding or blood loss okay so this is a regulatory mechanism uh, you can imagine the, the, the clinical uh, correlation here you can imagine that edrf uh, would play a very good important role in uh, working against hypertension in people who get hypertensive i.e chronically increased blood pressure uh, in them edrf would tend to decrease the, the the consequences of hypertension however on the on the other hand endothelin due to for example there is a person who has chronic hypertension for many years uh, hypertension is obviously a very bad thing in the long term hence it's very important for hypertensive people or people who have tendency to have hypertension to look at their blood pressure and keep it on the downward slope okay because if you don't do that if there is uncontrolled hypertension what will tend to happen is there will be endothelial cell damage because of the sheer the constant tension on the wall all the time and when it when that happens you know what happens endothelium uh, uh, is released which causes vasoconstriction in an already stressed environment okay uh, and uh, and and the further damage can occur if this person is hypertensive okay so we've done the acute mechanisms now let's hop on to the long term ones and here you go you have the, the that graph shown again uh, look at the red and the green lines okay and this is basically uh, uh, basically to show you now uh, the way the green line has been plotted in this graph so any increases in mean arterial pressure over longer duration of time will have uh, these long term mechanisms come into play which really bring keep the blood flow to the minimum any increases will be shunt uh, will be shunned even though you are really increasing the feeding pressure the mean arterial pressure so how come this is achieved clearly acute mechanisms which we have discussed up till now do provide you immunity but to a certain point and then if you if you keep on increasing blood pressure the blood flow will start increasing which is catastrophic rate but uh, alhamdulillah what happens in long term mechanisms what happens is uh, the the curve is flattened even during the long term so what could possibly happen in the long term which gets us this very marvelous result well, a couple of things actually number one is angiogenesis angiogenesis as the name indicates is formation of new vessels okay you see that this is uh, yes it's a guyton diagram and this is a skeletal muscle of uh, a rat i believe and this is a normal picture of the muscle and these white beads are the blood vessels and then they stimulated the muscle at a specific rate over months and see how the white beads have increased so this is angiogenesis also to note is the size of the of the muscle fibers has actually decreased so there's decrease of uh, diameter of the muscle fiber increase angiogenesis basically the surface air, uh, surface area ratio of vessel to its supplying mass is really improved for better circulation and to make it more leaner and meaner, as they say in slang. And uh, how is this vascularity changed? Uh, a key role is oxygen. Uh, then there are uh, various endothelial drive growth factors. The EGF is one, uh, fibroblast growth factor, angiogenin. All of this uh, you can uh, read in your books. They are pro angiogenesis. Uh, and then there is uh, 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 this. This is an important principle that vascularity uh, basically is determined by uh, the number of times the maximum blood flow had to be achieved to address the metabolic profile of the tissue. Okay, not the average. So a blood a a, a muscle of a bodybuilder, uh, it really peaked in its blood flow requirement in, in its uh, metabolic requirements during one of his 
exercise routines okay so now the body will calculate that okay this this guy uh, his muscles uh, have this upper end of this uh, metabolic uh, requirement of the muscle so the vascularity will then increase in those muscles keeping in view that peak and not his average during the day when he would go about his normal business okay this is an important point uh, there are limitations in the sense that the new vessels i beg your pardon uh, the new vessels are they don't function as the normal quote unquote genuine vessels uh, they generally are dormant vasoconstricted then only uh, yani they may not give you a lot of backup uh, during uh, rest however when the body goes into a, an exercise or increase metabolic profile then these these new vessels come into play they dilate and they provide you the backup and the word is backup really they uh, are together with the existing vasculature they fill fill up the gaps uh, for blood flow here i would like to mention reiterate the role of oxygen that is played in angiogenesis it's a it's a very interesting thing in uh, in neonates who uh, are born prematurely they have to be kept under uh, artificial oxygen when they are born right so what has been observed and it's very interesting and guyton details it is during that time uh, uh, during which they have to be given uh, supplemental oxygen their vessels the growth of their vessels really drops okay because you are supplying uh, adequate oxygen so it really for angiogenesis and especially this is a fetus now so everything needs to first develop so if you supply it with uh, enough or a bit more of oxygen the body will not feel the need for making new vessels how's that so this this little guy his vessels will stop growing if there is too much oxygen given over a longer period of time so if if uh, allah forbid he is in distress respiratory distress and you have to keep him there there is a cost that you incur uh, in terms of the angiogenesis that in his case is the 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 original angiogenesis which needs to take place a part of the normal development right so much so that sometimes what happens uh, uh, is when you take them out of this uh, artificial oxygen environment uh, there is an explosion of angiogenesis and you would think that's a good a good thing right not if you are in sitting in the eye in the eye the retinal vessels really start to sprout to the extent that they even come on to the cornea causing blindness okay uh, causing blindness now this is uh, just to uh, signify the role oxygen plays a lack of oxygen plays so coming back to normal life if you increase uh, if you start to exercise the muscles concerned muscles with the exercise will have increased oxygen demand because the existing oxygen profile is not enough now this increase oxygen demand will dictate angiogenesis basic this is the concept okay formation of collaterals as the name indicates uh, if there is a blockage uh, of a vessel uh, collaterals would develop which bypass the collat uh, the the blockage uh, these new vessels can form within minutes to hours they, and they continue to grow and multiply in the coming weeks uh, these are collaterals uh, not as good as the main artery but uh they if they if they are allowed to grow and multiply enough uh, uh they can provide a a decent enough uh backup to the to the tissue uh such that no great uh, problem or damage uh, happens uh by the by blocking or semi blocking of the feeding vessel this whole thing comes to come to focus uh, in uh, coronary artery disease uh, in which the 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 atherosclerotic plaque 
now has pouched into the lumen and has actually blocked it. So if there's a coronary and it's blocked, you can imagine what would happen. Uh, and check this out. It's a very interesting detail. In most of us, alhamdulillah, what happens is during our time, we do uh, have this atherosclerosis going on since our teens. Okay, In your case, you are a teenager probably. I'm talking about myself here. So uh, this atherosclerosis has been going on for a while. And depending on your diet, etc., etc., uh, the rate of atherosclerosis varies. Now, generally speaking, people who don't end up having a heart attack or any significant heart event, what happens is there is atherosclerosis. There are thrombi that form, which semi or not completely occlude, but sort of half occlude a vessel affecting the coronary blood flow to the uh, to to wherever uh, whichever area of myocardium they're supplying, and this causes decrease in oxygen tension and all that and causes the sprouting of collaterals. So while the guy is going through his life, normal routine, uh, he or she does not even know, notice that collaterals are actually sprouting out, bypassing these, uh, these blockages all the time. Like, okay, And they, they connect the pre-block part of the artery with the post-block uh, part of the artery uh, quite literally bypassing the blockage so that the blood flow to the to the wherever this artery was going is going is not compromised so this is very interesting uh, collaterals are formed in normal people in all the people actually if you exercise routinely guess what you increase these collaterals that's why people say people are asked to exercise routinely okay the more exercise they do, even if they were to do a 30 minute brisk walk um, every day, this person would have enough collaterals that if he behaves in his diet, does not smoke and has, doesn't have a very uh, wicked family history for heart disease, he may never have cardiac symptoms, even though there will be thrombi, there will be occlusions in his coronaries, but there'll be enough collaterals that this guy will be okay, okay? Okay, so one of the final points now uh, is vascular remodeling. So we have talked about angiogenesis, which is the formation of new vessels. We then talked about collaterals, which is the formation of new, uh, new vessels, which would bypass uh, a, a blocked vessel. Okay, now we, talked, now we can talk about uh, what if there, there are chronic changes in blood flow, blood pressure, or both. Okay, let me just clarify this here. So when I say increased blood flow, there's a problem in, in increased blood flow. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the volume. Okay. And when I'm saying increased blood pressure only without the flow component, I'm saying that there is only a problem with pressure. So let me further uh, give you a comment or two to clarify. In hypertensives, what essentially happens in most hypertensives is there, there's a chronic increase in blood pressure. Okay. Now, if this guy is, uh, is a new hypertensive, they will know, there, there won't be much change in the volume of blood. You will, have a, you will have the same volume of blood, but the arteries would be stiffer than a younger chap. So they won't expand to accommodate this to accommodate for this uh, increase in pressure. When they become stiffer, the same cardiac output would now cause increase in blood pressure. If you remember the formula for blood pressure, formula for blood pressure is cardiac output into total peripheral resistance. So cardiac output being constant, but the wall has become stiffer. So the resistance will be more, resulting in increased blood pressure. Yes. So there are scenarios where, where you would have chronically increased blood pressure. Then you have scenarios where your kidneys, as a result of this hypertension, will start to retain fluid. You have decreased uh, uh, kidney uh, blood flow for, for, for reasons which we'll discuss in hypertension. And the kidney will start to retain more fluid. It shouldn't, but it does because that's how it's designed. 
and you have now two two issues you have stiffer arteries and you have more blood volume so double the trouble for this chap and uh, let's see how uh, this whole thing now fits into our long term regulation of local blood flow so there are four mechanisms mentioned in your textbook okay first scenario is eutrophic remodeling uh, which is depicted here very nicely actually so this is a normal blood vessel no problems in pressure or flow and now what happens is that there is increase in pressure how will this uh, 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 this vessel how may this vessel respond one of the ways is inward eutrophic remodeling which basically is it uh, it rearranges its visceral muscles first it vasoconstricts of course we we've, we've discussed this on the myogenic mechanism and over chronic if that thing if that event of increased pressure was not addressed and now it has become chronic i e increased blood pressure all the time then those vessels which constricted their vessel wall the visceral smooth muscle in their wall uh, readjusts and now this is a very interesting word readjusts it readjusts in a way to accommodate or absorb this increase in pressure but still keeping the same cross sectional area i was thinking of an example for this to explain it to you it's like uh, you know a new sock there is a new brand new new sock that you've just bought okay as compared to your old sock or your dad's sock okay uh, which he has worn out or uh, because of maybe he has a bigger foot uh, it it has different dimensions your new sock you put it on okay what does the sock do does the sock change its uh, uh, internal diameter uh, uh, it does but how does it do it it basically adapts to the the shape of your foot by readjusting its balls doesn't it you have never paid attention to the sock did you if you did you would understand a new sock when you put your foot in it it will readjust by readjusting the small small elastic components in its balls so that it takes the shape of your foot okay your foot will not change its shape of course the sock will have to oblige and it does that by changing its uh, uh, shape the shape of the wall the volume being the same okay it's the closest guys it's the closest example that i could think of uh, while not being explained it with my like, not having to explain it with my hands or, or with a blackboard this is the best i think example uh, inward eutrophic remodeling is in in small vessels which constricted trying to resist the chronic uh, change in blood pressure with no cross sectional area by readjusting the uh, smooth muscle in the wall so that it absorbs the blood pressure so that's one way uh, uh, things can happen which controls local blood flow the second one is an explanation of the large vessels which don't constrict again this happens and basal constriction happens in the small muscles a uh, small vessel side that you got the larger ones they don't vaso constrict instead what happens in them is a, is a phenomena called hypertrophic remodeling which is depicted here so basically what happens is the the visceral smooth muscles they proliferate in number and they enlarge in size okay so they resist the damaging effect of increased blood pressure over a long period of time this increases their thickness and the total surface area okay and this by the way also increases their stiffness so this is that cost uh, that you you need to understand you have chronic hypertension hypertrophic remodeling will absorb that hypertension will absorb that chronic raised blood pressure all the time by literally uh, increasing the thickness of large arteries so that they don't burst or they don't uh, they don't damage uh, easily by this constant increase in pressure however by adding to their thickness they also become stiff 
So the diastolic pressure will drop and the systolic pressure will increase, basically saying the blood pressure will further increase, further worsening the hypertension. Um, remember, these are not, these are just remedial measures. These are not uh, therapeutic in the sense that they don't bring the whole thing down to dot. This is the normal vessel, not this, not this, this. So we need to keep the vessel as much as possible in this scenario. If we don't uh, properly uh, uh, control our food or we don't exercise or we do the silly thing called smoking, then you will end up having this which will, okay, hold the fort for a while, but it, this in itself is a problem. This makes the whole thing stiff, okay? Third point is out, outward remodeling. So when, they are, when this whole system is, in, is, is exposed to even further chronic increases in blood flow, so if the kidneys keep on adding volume uh, to, the, to the blood, okay? Uh, uh, what happens is this will then expand the... The, the lumen of these large vessels will expand uh, with little change in the wall of the vessel, in the wall of the vessel. And you have a total increase in cross-sectional area. Now look at the cross-sectional area here, here, and then look at the cross-section here. There's obviously a greater cross-sectional area through which blood can flow. This again will... Uh, uh, contribute to decreasing the blood pressure that this increased uh, blood flow will obviously exert on the walls. By enlarging this whole lumen, you're trying to uh, dissipate that increased pressure that comes in with, the, with that increased blood flow, okay? By increasing the cross-sectional area. And lastly, outward hypertrophic remodeling. This was outward remodeling. This is high, outward hypertrophic remodeling. This happens when the guy is not listening to the doctor. He is, uh, his diet is uh, outrageous. Salt intake is outrageous. Meat and all the, all the fried things and this, that, the other. He's not exercising. He's not quitting smoking. He's sedentary. He just sits in his office and works and does not move around much. So then what happens is the kidneys keep on adding uh, the fluid which increases his blood flow, uh, the volume of it, and his blood pressure also rises because the arteries are becoming stiffer and stiffer. In this case, the lumen does enlarge, uh, but to a lesser extent, the wall thickness really enlarges. The whole thing goes outwards. The total cross-sectional area does increase a lot, but at a cost which we have already discussed. So these are vascular remodeling the four scenarios where the vessels themselves remodel. The first two, uh, angiogenesis and collaterals, they are examples where they the vessels multiply in numbers. This is a, is, is, is a good depiction of how the existing vessels, they change their, their shape. This happens mainly in uh, uh, big and smaller arteries, while the number angiogenesis and collaterals, they uh, occur in the smaller vessels and meta-arterioles and capillaries and so on and so forth. Uh, just to mention, honorary mention of uh, uh, the hormonal uh, side of things, there are vasoconstrictor agents as we mentioned, vasodilators as we mentioned, there are different ions and agents which, which cause vasoconstriction and vasodilation. You can go through this list and read your, uh, the relevant section of uh, your textbook to have a view of this. Uh, this is a nice diagram which basically uh, sort of summarizes what we have discussed in vasoconstriction uh, and vasodilation phenomena. Okay, this brings us to the end of this chapter. Again, this chapter is, uh, it has a lot of information, but I think if you follow the sequence that I have described, uh, you will uh, find that it, you can retain it better. The important questions that come in this, like, uh, in this topic are uh, basically oxygen demand theory, uh, metabolic theory. Uh, somebody can ask you to define autoregulation, active and reactive hyperemia, uh, or you may get a question or two about uh, uh, enlisting or briefly describing long-term change in uh, uh, 
blood flow, the mechanisms that govern it, in which you can then discuss the free angiogenesis, collaterals, and uh, remodeling. Uh, the, the four scenarios of remodeling. Okay, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa